start. Hello, hello, welcome everyone. Um, welcome all. <clears throat> and thank you for joining Women's Way for closing the Gender Wealth Gap Forum, exploring models of shared wealth. I am Diane Corman Levy, the Chief Disruptor of Women's Way, and I'm delighted that you all decided to spend the next 90 minutes with us on this late summer, July hot day. <laughs> so when we refer to women, <clears throat> we mean trans and cis women and femme identified people, which includes anyone who is not a trans or cis woman, but who identifies as feminine and also those who identify as gender expansive, non-binary and gender non -conform. While we wait for folks to sign on, I would appreciate you taking the poll, which will pop up on your screen. We always want to know if this is the first time attending a Women's Way event. So if you could just answer that, that would be great. Thank you very much. So today's forum is part of a year-long series whose purpose is to educate different stakeholders about the drivers of the gender wealth gap and action steps each of us can take to help close the gender wealth gap. Since October, 2020, we have conducted 22 forums that address different drivers of the gender wealth gap, such as strengthening the early childhood education sector, decreasing gender and racial disparities in healthcare, increasing access to affordable housing, promoting equity and grant making, and eliminating the student debt crisis. Today's session explores cooperatives that focus on worker ownership and shared wealth, which are key components for building more equitable and just economies. You will hear from three amazing panelists who will discuss how this communal wealth building strategy benefits local communities and local workers and why co-ops are central to democratic economic participation. You will also have opportunities to ask questions to the speakers via the Q&A button located at the bottom of your screen, and we will do our best <clears throat> to address as many of your questions as possible. Closed, cap closed cap captioning is enabled. If you do not want to see closed captioning, you can click hide CC at the bottom of your screen. The chat is also enabled, so please share your comments during the session. We'd love to see how people are reacting to the conversations. And to create a safer space for all of us to engage in honest and sometimes challenging discussions, we ask each of you to abide to the session norms listed in the chat box. Finally, we will record the session and make it available for you to view again if you want to, and for those who could not attend today's session. After the session, we will also send you a list of resources and related to today's topic and a survey to evaluate the session. And we do really appreciate if you complete the survey because we deeply value your input as we work to continually improve these educational forums. So before we introduce you to the panelists and moderator, I first wanna thank our session sponsor, <clears throat> Ballard Spar. Uh, for their generous support. I just want to give a shout out to them too. They also are our legal counsel and have provided pro bono legal support for the past 46 years, ever since Women's Way started. So Kelly Shear, the director of the Gender Wealth Institute, and I are going to spend a few minutes on providing an overview of the economic state of women and children, why we are investing our resources in addressing the gender wealth gap, and key concepts related to the gender wealth gap. So for those who don't know about Women's Way, we were the first umbrella funding federation in the United States specifically dedicated to women's issues. We were formed in the mid-1970s um, that to really address issues such as wage equity, rape crisis, domestic violence, reproductive freedom, and post-incarceration reentry. We are a four-gender racial justice organization whose mission is to achieve gender and racial equity by building collective power to disrupt systems of oppression and strengthen alternative models centered in love, liberation, and inclusion. In terms of the economic state of women, I wish I could say it was really great, but it's not. Many women are still surviving and not thriving. Just some key data points, 80% of workers in the United States are still living paycheck to paycheck, majority of women. 47%, almost 50% of Americans are not able to cover an unexpected $400 expense. Again, majority are women. 
Philadelphia still has the highest poverty rate among the 10 largest cities, hovering around 25%, and the largest demographic group living in poverty are women ages 25 to 34. So we're going to be talking about the gender wealth gap, which is larger than the pay equity gap and actually has worsened. And related to the gender wealth gap is the retirement gap. They are predicting at this point, if we don't address these issues and these wealth, the wealth gap, that 80% of women are likely to be living in poverty by age 65. So if these current trends continue across economic, social, health, political, and education equality, then gender parity will not be achieved until 2133. That's way too long. So what is the gender wealth gap? <clears throat> this uh, depicts uh, how non-Hispanic, white, Hispanic, non-Hispanic black and non-Hispanic black women compared to non-Hispanic white men in terms of wealth. So single white women own 56 cents on the dollar compared to single white men. It goes in significantly down as uh, for Hispanic women who own 10 cents and non-Hispanic black women own five cents. And there are many reasons for the gender wealth gap and one we'll be talking about more in relation to worker power, um, the status of employee wages. But I also want to talk about this in terms of the larger economic model, or how, our, how our economic system looks across the country. The top 1% of the population holds 47% of the nation's wealth. And you'll see that the average income in this percentage is over $374,000 per year. And the majority of these are actually cis white men. And there's reasons for that. While the 80% of the population only holds 9% of the nation's wealth, this has really gotten worse over the last few years. And this makes up, um, people that make up this part are middle and working class folks, many of them unemployed, people on welfare, homeless individuals with an average income of $41,000 per year. Many of people in the bottom 80%, in the, it's the 80% are actually women as well. This is unsustainable, right? having 1% of the population in our country holding 40% of the nation's wealth. So in order to close the gender wealth gap, we really need to answer these questions, how wealth and power were built in America and how they currently operate. The reason we have, we are addressing inequities is because our economic system was intentionally designed to create inequities. I think a really important point to understand that wealth comes from the extraction of others. And I don't think people really understand that. So the expanding pools of great wealth are created by financial extraction, such as the growing crisis of families trapped in predatory lending and unsustainable debt, the stifling of small and medium-sized businesses that create jobs and dark money's attack on democracy. Every asset that's held by one person is actually a claim against someone or something else. Debt is a claim on your income. A share of stock, which everyone thinks is great, is a claim on a company's value. And boosting that value often means cutting workers' income to increase profits, which is a claim against workers. The other thing to understand is the bias rules of capitalism, which is really our, our economic system, right? And how they drive today's gender and racial inequities. And capital bias is the bias towards the maximum increase in capital which is the maximum benefit to wealth holders, which operates inside the processes and institutions through which capital deploys functional power. So capital is the money that must limitlessly grow and operates through the mechanisms of profit extraction. So in order to build an inclusive and equitable economy, we need to have a bold vision for our economy that provides solutions to centuries a systemic exclusion, extraction, and exploitation, which has really undermined the economic potential of, in the United States. So uh, in 2020-21, we created the Gender Wealth Institute to really address the gender wealth gap um, by advancing research and practical solutions that build wealth for women who are economically insecure. And it's really important to understand that we're trying to address the root and systemic causes of gender economic inequities. And this was built on a strong foundation where we've been working with uh, over 100 partners who are trying to advance economic security of women and gender expansive individuals since 2017. So I'm gonna pass this on to, uh, to Kelly Sheard, our wonderful director of the Gender Wealth Institute, who's gonna be talking about what we mean by wealth. Thank you, Diane, can you hear me? Yes. Great, 
All right. So first, we want to begin by centering our definition of wealth pioneered by our friends at the Maven Collaborative. When wealth is accumulated, we live and retire with greater dignity, freedom, and peace of mind. Our communities are prosperous, resilient, and vibrant. Future generations have the freedom to dream big and become all they can truly be. And we're healthy and know that our families, networks, and communities are healthy, spiritually whole, and contributing. It's important to start here because we want to move the conversation beyond individual economic stability and the possession of financial assets. Both of these concepts are important, but often not enough to encompass the lived experience of abundance that we all seek to build. Next slide. We also want to start by stating our theoretical framework for how race and gender interplay in the expression of power, as well as how our current economic system functions. Consider these points are key concepts. Next slide. First, a brief primer on racialized capitalism. We understand capitalism to be the private ownership of property where one class of people control and profit from the labor of the subordinate class. The social structure of capitalism reflects a system of relationships of domination among categories of people. The subordinate class is necessarily racialized and the dominant class is white. As it relates to capitalism, whiteness is institutional, collective and cumulative and has little to do with individual experiences. It is a structural advantage that confers dominance and causes racialized outsiders to compete to seek the rewards and privileges of whiteness. Next slide. Wealth supremacy helps us understand why we exist in an economic system that believes wealthy people matter more than others. This concept refers to cultural and political processes and attitudes by which the wealthy accumulate and maintain prestige, power, and privilege, as well as how wealth is protected and grown by the privileged class. It's about the myths of extraction and exploitation that drive hoarding, as well as the systems design that reflects the valuation and protection of that extreme hoarding. Next slide. Finally, heteropatriarchy is a logic that justifies the subordination of all those who are not heterosexual cisgender men. The civilizing projects of a gender binary, along with the construction of heterosexuality as normative, serve the interests of the dominant. Anything outside of the constructed norm is seen as deviant and unworthy, and therefore oppression becomes justified. There's an ethos of meritocracy and a system designed to protect the interest of the dominant. These are brief primers on three concepts that we feel are important. Of course, this doesn't encompass every idea worth mentioning, but instead offers a framework to understand how we get to dangerous outcomes like the gender wealth gap. Next slide. As we explore our topic uh, for today, exploring shared wealth models, a reminder that part of the work of liberation is to uncover the plot, that is the intentions, actions, and outcomes. Next slide. And I'm happy to transition our conversation and exploration to our moderator for this conversation, Mo Mangklang, Policy Director for the U.S. Federation of Worker Cooperatives. Welcome, Mo. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Kelly, Diane, and Women's Way for having me and a lot of my, some of my cooperative fellows uh, along for this conversation. Um, so my name, uh, as Mo Mankling, I'm the policy director at the U.S. Federation of Worker Cooperatives. Um, if we can get my slides up, I just have a couple of slides to give folks a little bit of context for cooperatives, um, and then I'll ask the rest of the panelists to um, to come off camera as well. <clears throat> um, so, if you're if you're not familiar with cooperatives, 
the, the short of it is you probably are. Um, so most people know of a food cooperative um, that you might have in your neighborhood or you're part of a credit union. Um, most people don't think of those as cooperatives, but they are. You actually do have an ownership role in a credit union if you're a part of one. Um, and you can go to slide two. Um, thanks so much. And um, so, you know, the little bit of background on on us is that, so the U.S. Federation of Worker Cooperatives is the only national grassroots membership organization for worker cooperatives and democratic workplaces. So that means businesses that are uh, wholly owned or, or um, are majority owned and run by their workers. Um, and also some nonprofits that also are formulated in that way, even though they are um, technically a nonprofit. So the work that we do is to build a thriving co-op movement um, to create good jobs, jobs that empower people, that build wealth for communities. Um, and we do that through worker ownership. So we do a lot of things from events to education to advocacy, which is my main job. Um, and we work with some really wonderful folks um, who you'll hear more from uh, on the panel today. Next slide. So just to kind of double down on what I was saying earlier, so there's different kinds of cooperatives. So um, food cooperatives, credit unions, those, those fall into the first area, which is consumer cooperatives. Probably you may have purchased something from REI or maybe you're a part of the Philadelphia Federal Credit Union. So those are ones where the, the members own the business, but they're not necessarily the workers. So it's someone who like experiences the benefits. So you might be shopping there or having your money uh, land at the at the bank of a, of a credit union. Um, and then we have, I'm going to skip over worker cooperatives for a second and go to producer cooperatives. So if you had the delicious cabot cheese that is a integral part of my life, um, or you've had anything from Organic Valley or Ocean Spray, those are producer cooperatives. Those are um, cooperatives that include uh, different businesses that come together to share uh, share resources like a backbone, like it might be um, like uh, a bunch of farmers coming to together like Cabot Cooperative and they come together to do marketing and some kind of like sharing of resources. Um, some people use it as like administrative back end. So it's ways that different businesses, even if they're not cooperatives, can come together. Um, I love to see or hear people talking about Mondragon uh, in the chat. Please keep asking questions and chatting in the chat. I'll keep an eye on that uh, throughout the session today. Um, and for today, we're mostly focused on worker cooperatives. So those are businesses, like I said, that own and make decisions together. Um, you'll hear from a couple of worker cooperatives today. You might have had Equal Exchange Coffee or um, or uh, Co-op Ride is a cooperative uh, taxi co-op in, uh, in New York City. Um, so, you know, the majority of the ownership and, and a lot of times 100% of the ownership of a worker cooperative is um, by and for the workers. So it's usually like, it's, it's always one worker and one vote. Um, and they might have some other money coming in that's helping to support the business, but all of the governance of the business and how it works, that lives with the workers. So that's what really what we're gonna be talking, um, talking about today. Um, yes, producer cooperatives uh, can be like sister companies if I'm interpreting that right. Uh, of what you're saying, Athena. Um, so, you know, producer cooperatives, like they, they're just working together. Um, and, and sometimes we've actually seen cooperatives come together to create a producer cooperative. Um, like uh, Up and Go Cooperative is one uh, where you can get uh, your home cleaned. Um, so they're like home cleaning co-ops. Um, and there are a bunch of them. There's actually one in Philadelphia. There's a bunch of them in New York. Um, and they come together to share kind of like administrative and marketing um, services so that they can build that power together. Um, so next slide. Um, I, I won't spend too much time on this because I've been talk, kind of talking through it, but typically worker cooperatives are values driven businesses. They have not only just the normal kind of like, you know, this is uh, our business and this is how we're legally formed, but they also have a bylaws that talk about like how they want the business to run. Usually it includes um, some kind of community benefits um, 
It includes like how the workers work together, how they make decisions together. So whether it's, you know, a small company might make decisions like by themselves, like, you know, with everyone at the table, some businesses, if they're bigger, might have different committees and how they work together. So, um, so uh, there, there's different ways that kind of cooperatives can be formed and they can be anywhere from, you know, just a few, three, three or four people up to, you know, 1500 people um, is the, is the largest worker cooperative in the country at the moment. Um, so there's a lot of different, uh, different ways that a worker cooperative might look. Um, but the thing that they have in common is that the workers own the business. They are participating in the financial success of it. So they're, they're, uh, they're getting a cut of the profits and they decide how that works together. Um, and they have representation and they vote for the board of directors um, that, that adheres to that one worker, one vote principle. Next slide. So, um, you know, Diane mentioned earlier, um, you know, this kind of like bold new vision for how do we how do we address these big systemic inequities that um, are manifested through capitalism, through really like a lot of the structures that, that this country kind of like sits on. Um, worker cooperatives make opportunities for people. A lot of the people that we see, especially in the last few years, that come to cooperatives as a structure are first time entrepreneurs, people who like really want their values to be kind of infused um, into the business. People who are like locked out of the job market, like if they're re-entering citizens or um, like uh, immigrant worker, uh, immigrant workers who are like having trouble finding a job. Um, businesses that that might be threatened by closure. And increasingly, a lot of people that work in the kind of contractor gig worker areas and especially labor intensive industries. So the biggest industries within the worker co-op space uh, include, you know, like child care, home care, um, food and beverage industries. So like cafes, uh, restaurants, bakeries, things like that. <clears throat> uh, next slide. And this is my last one, I promise. Uh, is uh, So this is a quick snapshot of uh, worker cooperatives in the United States. So this is worker cooperatives and democratic workplaces. So it includes some nonprofits. Um, there's verified about 711 worker co-ops in the country um, as of uh, FY 2022. Um, we estimate that there's more like a thousand that we just maybe don't even know about. And that represents about like 10,000 workers across the country. So there's a lot of concentration in California and New York and, you know, like especially in the kind of Northeast area. Um, so, you know, we're kind of sitting in, in the Philadelphia area in kind of more of like a hotbed. So like a lot of the cooperatives that exist, exist somewhere in between kind of like Maryland and Maine, right? So in this kind of Eastern seaboard, we have tons and tons of cooperative history. Um, so that is kind of the background that I wanted to serve up to folks. I, I love all the, uh, all the chat that I'm seeing. I'd love, um, and let's just get into it. I'm going to bring, um, Ana Martina Rivas, Terrell Cannon, and Corey Reedy here um, onto the panel. These are very uh, loved and cherished pals in the cooperative universe. So it's really lovely to uh, to spend this time together and share space together. Um, so what I, what I want to do is just kind of you know I, I've given that kind of worker co-op base level um, and. Please, if there's something, if there's some lingering questions, please use the chat and the and the questions to uh, to ask those. But let's start off by just hearing from you all first, just a little bit about your organization, so people can get to know you, um, and just you know, just a just a couple minutes about like who you are, and also just how did you, what brought you to the cooperative world, like especially worker co-ops. How did how did, what was your journey to getting here? Um, cause it's usually like the juiciest part of how people make it to this space is knowing like, what are the, what are the, uh, what's the, what was the pathway to get you here? So, um, I'm going to ask for, let's see, let's do Terrell and then Corey and then Ana Martina. So we'll start with Terrell, uh, and yeah, take it away. Hi, hello everyone. Thanks for being here. Um, again, thank you, Kelly, Diane, and Women's Way for having me. I am Terrell Cannon. I am from Home Care Associates, one of Philadelphia's only home care worker co-ops. Um, 
I came to the worker co-op world because I was working in the healthcare field, but I was in a nursing home where I was just a person that was clocking in and clocking out. It was just a number, just a shift filler. And I wanted to come to a place where I was more supported, involved, and had a better job, quite frankly. I um, was not happy where I was in the nursing home um, because I was not able to be involved in anything other than doing my job at the workplace where I was, although I was interested to know how things really work, they weren't, you know, open to letting me know that information because I wasn't an owner. I was just an employee. So I came into the co-op world um, because I wanted a better job. I wanted a voice. I wanted to be supported in the work that I've done. So that's what brought me here to the co-op world and have been here since 1993 and happy that I've made this choice. Thanks so much, Terrell. Corey, you want to share next? Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Corey Reedy. She, her pronouns. Um, I am a co-op developer at Philadelphia Area Cooperative Alliance, but we just call it PACA. Um, Mo is founder of PACA. Um, and so PACA... There are many entities across the country similar to PACA, which works to provide technical assistance. We have other programs, but the heart of our work is providing technical assistance to cooperatives um, because cooperative businesses are different than other businesses. You have multiple owners that are um, collectively and democratically um, moving into this venture together. And so, Everything is different when you have multiple owners, your legal stuff is different, your financial stuff is different. And so um, PACA was formed to make sure that um, co-ops had the support that they needed in Philly. Um, and I got into co-ops um, when I was young and impressionable at around 20 in Baltimore. And um, I uh, started getting involved with um, a co-op in Baltimore called Red Emma's Bookstore Coffee House, and I was becoming like really politicized at the same time. And then I became a worker owner of Red Emma's, um, and so I feel like my um, my belief in how we create a better world um, went hand in hand with that workers have to own their own businesses and have to um, be organizing within them democratically. And, um, you know, oftentimes we say in co-op world that once you've participated in direct democracy, you can't ever go back. And I definitely found that, that like after, you know, I had been a part of a worker co-op at a young age, um, any other business I went to, I just could not be happy. And so I decided to not be in any business that was not a cooperative check. Thanks, Corey. Anna. Hi, Mo. Hi, Corey and Terrell. And hi, everyone. Uh, Anna Martina, she, her, um, ella, they, ella. Um, I am a member and co founder of Colmenar Cooperative Consulting. I am a former co worker of Mo, and I also sit at the board of PACA. So this is like family conversation, and Terrell as well is on the board. Um, so, yeah, um, let me see. Well, Colmenar, um, we're cooperative, uh, consulting cooperative. Our work focuses primarily in offering uh, technical assistance to organizations that want to incubate or develop cooperatives, but also to nonprofits or other organizations that are looking to develop um, an organizational structure that is more democratic our different models of shared leadership. Um, we do believe that once when we are in the experience of engaging in democratic participation, we're able to hear different opinions and engage in ways, in, 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 in ways that just, you know, allow us to grow. Um, so the work that we do in the cooperative, it is with different organizations. We work a lot with cooperatives of immigrants, 
specifically from Latinx communities. I am an immigrant from Mexico, and I guess connecting a little bit my past to cooperatives, um, my dad was exiled from Chile. We were street vendors in Mexico. Like I grew up with the experience of um, being on the street economy, what we call, right? Like uh, marginal economies, because there is no many alternatives when you're coming from a different country. Even when you have education, uh, you have to start from scratch. And those are the experiences that we encounter with the communities that we're working on here in the United States. So, uh, you know, I always been involved in different organizations that are working with immigrants, uh, with feminist economies, and with organizations that were also somehow, you know, uh, organized as collectives. Uh, so cooperatives is just the place where I feel at home and yeah, it's where I feel like more um, able to be a bridge to support the communities that I am part of. Thank you so much, Ana Martina. Um, so as you can tell, we, you know, we are, we're like a close knit group of people here in like the Philly co-op scene. Um, and, you know, again, I want to thank Women's Way for kind of shining a light on this through this um, closing the gender wealth gap series, um, because right now it's, it's actually a really, uh, it's, it's an important moment within the, the sector, right? So, um, you know, so the, in the last few years, um, you know, we've had a, a lot of attention kind of like growing for the worker cooperative movement. Um, the first piece of le federal legislation um, about worker ownership passed in 2018. And kind of since then, it's kind of led to um, a lot of attention at different levels. So um, another bill called the Work Act um, created a division for just for employee ownership at the Department of Labor that just launched. Um, a lot of states have been passing legislation, including California, Washington, Massachusetts, New York, Rhode Island. Um, a lot of different states are kind of figuring out like what is what does worker ownership mean um, in the state, and how can it be used to you know to build wealth, to to balance the distribution of power in American workplaces how to invest in communities that are like either locked out or or generally underserved and really just at a base level to allow people to experience the benefits of worker voice and ownership. So like, you know, uh, like, you know, Terrell's already spoken towards this, like just like how important it is to like have a voice um, when you've come, come from a business that really doesn't listen to their workers to one where you have a central voice in how the business is run. Um, because, you know, as I think it might've been Kelly who said earlier, wealthy people do not matter more than others. Uh, and in most cases, the people closest to the issue, the people at the front lines hold the best solutions to the issues. Um, you know, during COVID worker co-ops, um, we did like a little study and worker co-ops had, had 86% of them had, um, already figured out ways built in to communicate with all of their workers quickly and were able to um, address like the issues that were cropping up because of COVID um, in, in real time and much faster than typical businesses. That doesn't mean that there were no problems, of course, but it did mean that they had a very direct connect, direct connection to all of the workers in the workplace to figure out how can we best deal with this like global pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, so just the, you know, like just talking, like really focusing in on um, on what does it mean to actually participate democratically and make decisions together. Um, I want to first maybe tap on um, Ana Martina and Terrell just to talk about like what does that look like in practice for you? Like how how do you maintain accountability? How do you make decisions together? What does that look like? Because um, knowing that like Ana Martina's uh, cooperative is like on the smaller side and Terrell's. Correct me if I'm wrong, but there's several hundred uh, workers at Home Care Associates, right, Trail? Yeah, yes, there is. So in our organization, our um, workers really do drive um, own the company. So when decisions are made in our organizations, they're, they're in our organization, they are made by the workers. Our workers are set up in several different committees that let, let's take COVID, for example. So I'll start with the board. Our board of directors are set up majority workers. So there's 12 members, seven of them are employees that represent the larger 
pool of worker owners that are working. So when we when COVID kind of hit fast and hard, we did a quick meeting. And of course, we couldn't do that in person. So everybody was available to to come over digital, whether it was Zoom or, they, or Teams or whatever. And we all met together to ask, what do you guys think is best for us to do in this situation and what we need to do? And the workers came up with the solution. Um, and what we all planned it together, the workers came up with the solution and we carried that solution out. So for us, one of the things were because we were the frontline workers and it is healthcare, we still had to service consumers. So our workers decided we'll rent vans and be able to have people drop people off. So we became the subway and the buses and things like that to make sure our workers were able to get to work safely and be able to provide a quality care to the consumers that were so in need of it during that difficult time. Um, I can share some in, in our cooperative, we're a small cooperative, um, we are three worker owners. Um, we take decisions uh, democratically um, based in consensus. We also use um, sometimes majority voting, depending on the type of, of decision that we're taking, but we all participate at the level of the governance and we are all uh, similarly like involved in different committees, you know, like they have to do more with comms or like programs, or marketing. But when it comes into uh, decisions, they are fluid decisions like financial decisions, we all have to come into agreement of what we want to do. And similarly to the experience that Terrell was mentioning, when we have to take decisions, there are hard decisions around like, for example, cutting our pay. Um, we have come into decisions that we are as fast as possible, you know, protecting everybody on, on, on the team uh, and making sure that, you know, that, that we are all you know, somehow uh, feeling good about that decision. So I wouldn't necessarily say that it's always easy. <laughs> Taking decisions together is, is hard, especially when we are not used to do it in our society. So it is a learning and an unlearning experience, right? Like where we sometimes have to learn also and like how to come into disagreements, hold disagreements in a way that is positive and generative. Um, so it is it is a really interesting learning experience, but I think overall, I agree with what is being shared here that um, when you are able to sit at the table and be part of the decision making or the rules like decisions, it feels really empowering in, in, in ways that, you know, I haven't experienced in other hierarchical organizations. Yeah. Um... With Corey was I think it was you that was saying like once you kind of like go cooperative it's very difficult to go back once you have that um, kind of taste of like what it is like to be a big participant um, in in how your organization works uh, it's very difficult to 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 do anything else <laughs> um, you know I it, I don't want to like idealize the idea of cooperative because it's it's still a business and still hard, right? Um, I'm gonna fold in this question from Christina in here into a question that we have here um, about like funding and technical support. Um, you know, Philadelphia certainly and many other cities, they, they put a lot of energy into support for small businesses and entrepreneurs. Um, and I would love Corey, if you could kind of kick us off in talking about how like how available are small business resources to cooperatives and um and oh, I just left but um I think is and if you could specifically talk about uh tech cooperatives because that's a question from from Christina about you know like how if someone is is trying to start a cooperative like where where would they start yeah I am um, I mean, okay so in terms of like getting access to the funding and the technical assistance that cooperatives need, it is very challenging. Like it is scarce. Um, a lot of technical assistance providers in many cities, um, states, like 
don't really understand cooperative models. I know that they may try their best, but they don't really understand them. Um, and oftentimes cities that provide a lot of funding to these technical assistance providers also don't understand the cooperative business model. So they tend to not give a lot of funding um, to cooperative technical assistance providers. Um, it's changing and I'll talk about that um, later. Um, and funding is incredibly challenging for cooperatives um, because funders don't understand a multiple person ownership model. Um, they want to give money to forms that they understand they um so oftentimes they just won't give funds to cooperatives because they don't understand them um or they're like okay we'll give you funds but we still need someone to give a personal guarantee which warps the cooperative because you want the cooperative to be a community institution that is held by the workers or held by the people that utilize the co-op and if you're saying that the health of this co-op with this loan um, is held on one person's shoulders, it really changes the dynamics of the co-op. And I've seen it really hurt the co-op because also you want it to be community owned. So you want it to be able to be that one person can leave and the co-op is still maintained. But if somebody has to sign a personal guarantee, that makes it really challenging to do that. And so um, you, access- Corey, oh, yeah, Corey, can you- unpack the personal guarantee and what that means a little bit? Yeah, um, it's one person saying that they are going to be liable for if the loan is not able to be repaid. And so if the loan is not able to be repaid, um, then like, I mean, a whole bunch of different things could happen, but like funders could seize the property of this one individual person. Um, like it could impact that one individual person's credit score. Like a lot of different things could happen, but like it, um, it and hopefully like if you are incorporated, you have some protections, but still a personal guarantee for funding um, can like you're, you're bypassing some of those incorporation protections. Um, and so it's just, you know, it, you know, funding is what it is under our current economy anyways. Um, but, uh, but like when you're thinking that it's like a community held endeavor and you're putting so much weight on one person's shoulders, it changes the community held dynamic. So, yeah. Thanks so much, Corey. Yeah. I, um, I will say this is an issue that the co-op movement, not just worker co but all cooperatives have been trying to address for many, 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 many years. Um, and it's something that, you know, it comes up in a lot of different kinds of ways. At, at a very base level, we're just looking, it's it's a way that cooperative businesses, even though there's more people invested in the businesses, are locked out of being able to access something that like every other small business is able to access in the country. Um, even though there's actually like, it's, it's spreading the risk across more people, yeah. but um, there's a technicality um, about small business personal guarantees through the Small Business Administration that makes it virtually impossible for worker co-ops. I know Terrell's done a bunch of advocacy on this as well. We talked about a, a bunch on, um, actually, uh, we're, we've been trying to shine a light on it um, at the federal level. And one thing I, I I kind of didn't get a chance to to note was that, you know, this is getting a lot of attention to the point that like Terrell and I actually were just at the White House for their first ever convening on worker ownership. And this is one of the big topics that came up is like, hey, there are still some really basic barriers that keep this this kind of business that is like anchored within communities. Um, it, it's, it's a real problem. And a lot of the big issue is education and outreach. So people just understanding um, what the issues are. So that's why spaces like these ones and partnerships like working with folks like Women's Way are so important to just do the education with folks who were just around. And, you know, hopefully when you all leave this space, you know more about HACA, about Colmenar, about Home Care Associates, and you know that there are these resources available to you um, just in your backyard. Um, so, you know, um, I'm just quickly looking through. Oh, one thing that I wanted to know, um, just to, answer, to, to put a pin in your question, Christina, is um, in terms of accessing resources specifically for tech cooperatives, 
Um, one thing that I, rec I really recommend is joining associations like PACA or like the Federation. I know this is a little bit of like a bias, <laughs> but having a network of people to tap into resources for is really important. We actually have, the Federation has a tech worker co-op peer network um, and where people who are like either in a tech worker co-op or trying to create one are able to just talk to each other and see like, how did you start? What are the, what do your bylaws look like? And having that kind of camaraderie is really important um, to help you move faster, better, stronger, so. I can unbias that to say that Home Care Associates is a part of PACA and the U.S. Federation of uh, Co-op Worker Co-ops. Um, and like Mo mentioned, having those uh, close networks and along with other co-ops is very beneficial to whatever type of co-op you're going to start out because that education and networking is most found in those places. Thanks so much, Terrell. Corey, did you want to add a little bit more? Yeah, just a a tiny bit more like, um, and also Colmenar is a member of PACA and PACA is a member of the Federation. And we're just, you know, cops do believe that like we build a just economy also through like the solidarity and this networking. And we do that all the time. Um, and I do want to say like things are changing. Um, you know, it's, it's a process. It's a, it's a work and an effort as Mo and Terrell were talking about. Um, but uh, like PACA, we do work with Seed Commons, which is a non-extractive lender specifically to cooperatives. And so we work to help um, co-ops get loans from them. And while they have a loan through us, through them, we give them at no additional cost technical assistance. And also we just entered into a three-year contract with the city um, to be able to expand our sliding scale and pro bono technical assistance. And so I do think things are changing and, you know, shout out to Liam and Nicole at the Department of Commerce who believe that cooperatives are a way to build a racial and gender economic justice in Philly. Um, and I think things are changing and that's you know, oftentimes by like the incredible um, educational work that, you know, folks have been doing for so long. So I just wanted to say like, you know, there's a lot of work that still needs to be done, but like things are, are changing and we can like feel it. So, yeah. Um, you know, we're talking a, l a little bit about funding and um, I saw this question in the chat about, you know, can co-op models be sustained by grants as a source of funding? Mm -hmm. um, and Corey, you just mentioned the funding that you're getting from the city. And I know I'm, I know that Anna Martina has a ton of thoughts here. Um, so I'm wondering if uh, if you, could, you two could speak a little bit to um, grant making as a way of supporting these businesses that are, you know, they're, they're still for-profit businesses. They're just businesses mm -hmm. that typically are, are anchored by value. So um, can you talk a little bit about um, grant making within the co-op space? I, I can share some, um, I mean, I do know that um, the funding that is available uh, to cooperatives sometimes also depends on the type of industry that you are part of. Um, sometimes, you know, there are specific funds or like lending, you know, um, institutions that will be more focused on like home care or like child care because they're invested in seeing grow of some of those industries. Um, and uh, sometimes uh, the process of uh, applying for a loan, it is tricky because, uh, you know, they also like lenders see collateral as the equipment that you are purchasing. For instance, if you're a bakery, you have ovens, you have kitchens, right? And that's, those are collateral. When you are um, a business, a cooperative business, like a tech company or a consulting business in our case, um, we as workers, we are, <laughs> we are like basically uh, the, the means of production, right? So um, we can all be collateral. <laughs> you know okay? So it can be challenging. So we have, as Gomenar in our cooperative, we have to navigate some of those challenges and we have found um, some uh, cooperative lenders in the ecosystem. We are, um, um, we borrowed from uh, the fund uh, um, from the ICA uh, the jobs uh, worth owning. Um, and our process, I can see, I can say that was uh, 
you know, it's challenging because there's like pieces around financial education uh, and every lender has their own process. But, um, you know, we feel very lucky that uh, we are consultants, right? Like we are able to navigate this. We do know the other folks they are starting. This is a real challenge. So I do agree that like it's education for funders, for lenders, for, um, you know, city governments, and also for members of cooperatives. We did publish um, a guide in Spanish on uh, financial education that is free is available. I can add the link because we noticed that like this piece of, you know, you need to present your financial projections. You need to know how to build that. So, you know, and I would say that for applying for loans, um, there is a whole process for applying for grants. There's a whole other process. You still have to create budgets. You still have to create um, sometimes deliverables. Uh, sometimes some grants um, will not support operations. Um, sometimes they're focused on projects. So it depends once again, you know, I, I do believe that sometimes it's easier to find grants. They are specifically supporting um, some, um, you know, social services that so you can partner with nonprofits or another fiscal sponsor organization to apply. Um, but it, those are relationships I feel like you have to build. Um, and the other grant that I know that is, is specifically available for cooperatives is from Cooperative Development Foundation. They do provide grants for um, for education for cooperatives, and, and, and they have other programs. So they are grants. They're just not so available. Um, and sometimes they are grants. They are from uh, small business associations, but each one has their own process. So... I highly recommend connecting with a regional organization that is in your area to really connect and help you to build those relationships. And if you need to build, um, you know, financial literacy to get the support. So that's where technical assistance comes in hand, right? That's a lot of the work that we do in Fulminat is supporting um, or cooperative clients to really being able to move through these processes. I mean, Anna Martina said <laughs> the majority of it. I think it was all yeah, beautiful. And I agree with everything she just said. But um, I guess if I were to add anything, um, I mean, I think I think each co-op has to navigate their own personal relationship with like accepting grants and donations um, and, you know, you know, if you are a co-op, you're committing also to principles. So you have to think through your principles um, when interacting with funders and uh, like what funders you're going to work with and what that means to you. And so I think each co-op has to like navigate that. Um, but I do think um, we see that co-ops are the most resilient when they also, and Anna was talking about this, when, when they also work as a business, like they are a business in order to be successful. They also have to work as a business. Um, and, you know, hopefully, you know, uh, at PACA, we believe that like co-ops are a model to transition to, you know, a non-reformist reform strategy to transition to a just economy. And um, in order to do that, co-ops actually do have to be successful as businesses. Um, and I also think, you know, when we look at that, the majority of people who start worker cooperatives are women and are black and brown and all people of color folks that, you know, marginalized folks really understanding how to make a business successful in an equitable way that shares community wealth and community control. Like that's pretty powerful um, because as Diane was talking about at the beginning, like this economy was not built for um, people who are not white cis men. And so um, like changing that dynamic and actually understanding your business, um, I think is powerful for a lot of people. Yeah. Check. Thanks, Corey. Um, you know, as a word, um, I, I want to dig into some more issues around kind of like the other kinds of challenges, but just to wrap up this um, area of funding because it's tied so closely to policy and maybe this can be our bridge is, um, you know, there's, there's, there's funding for co worker cooperatives as a structure, right? And then there's also 
funding for worker cooperatives or in cooperatives as a whole in an industry basis, right? So um, one thing I'll add in the chat right now is, you know, <clears throat> looking at different policies, like in this case, the Chips and Science Act funded, has, has already funded um, investments in innovation. It's not necessarily tech, um, but I, I think like looking at um, particular industries and like what resources are already out there is really interesting um, because it's, it's an area where we're not, the, we've already named that people understanding the structure of a worker cooperative is, is really hard. But if you're tapping into it from like, you know, what about money specifically for home care or specifically for um, for rural farming, right? Um, like these are areas like the, there's a, a rural cooperative grant program that has existed for a long time that has helped to get a lot of cooperatives off the ground. And one thing that I do that I do notice is that a lot of times the money is, is actually for technical assistance. So it'll fund organizations like PACA, right? Or like, like even like Colmenar, that money can flow through to actually help do the training and education for people needed to actually start or convert their business to a worker cooperative. Um, so I, you know, I, I think that's one way that kind of like grant funding or, or federal funding can, can help in those ways. But I, I'm wondering um, if there are any other policies that you all would recommend that um, could support co-ops in Philly and other places. And I'm a little biased because I'm policy director and I, I have a lot of opinions on this, but I would love to hear from you, especially maybe like Terrell, because I know that you do quite a bit of advocacy. Um, like what, what policies would you recommend um, or do you see that are like the most important right now? Um, you're muted, Terrell. There you go. So I, First and foremost, Mo, you know, my whole pet peeve is with this uh, small business administration. <laughs> I would like that personal guarantee to be changed immediately. Um, um, but, you know, the the policies that I see is for, for you know, it's for co-ops to be included in those same areas of funding as a 5013C or um or as a as a uh, not so small business we should there should be policy around us being able to access those funds just as others you know that we should be and policies that will regard us in the same light as and not just for funding but as businesses um as any other elite business there is like it, it's unfortunate that for co-ops we have to fight to have these, to be in the spaces or in the meetings in those arenas where lawmakers are and policy makers are and things are being changed. We have to fight to get there. We should be invited to those tables immediately without, you know, having to connect with through these different elements to get there. The policy should be very inclusive to all and not separate the businesses, whether it's co-op, for-profit, non-profit. We shall all be included in these policies and laws that are being made to include all of what we're doing. Because at the end of the day, we're all one and as human and we are the workforce. So why not include us, have those policies, have that inclusion for all of us so that we don't have to jump through the loopholes just to get to the table to be able to have the voice for them to understand and get the education. I think if it was reversed and those things was made to be the education and all of the information knowing about co-ops would be readily, it, it's already readily available, but it would be more obtainable for them. So that way, when those things are happening, we're there already and not having to fight to get there. That's absolutely right, Terrell. Thank you for that. Um, Anor Corey, are there any, is there anything that you want to add here on in terms of like policies um, through the government that you would want to see? I mean, I think what Terrell was like mentioning, you know, I I do agree, you know, I do see the worker owners need to be able to sit on the table, and I do need the worker cooperatives also to be able to uh, to also be able to access funding to support 
uh, you know, grow their, their, their businesses that have been already established because you form a business and, and it takes time to grow, right? Um, and what I was thinking actually, you know, with this question, Mo, I was actually curious of you, Mo, because when you started at the Federation, uh, you know, you, we started, I don't know, like some years ago, and like, I kind of like have seen how the panorama has changed with opportunities for workplace cooperatives. There's a time that you joined the Federation as a policy director, so, you know, I, I think that we have made a lot of progress, but I think that we also need to continue doing the work. Like, I think that it's so important at the federal level, yes. But locally, you know, just getting commitment of city councils to for like to fund programs to support access for for the cooperatives because we have seen how our strategy uh, around advocacy for the growth work of cooperatives can be very efficient when we're focusing in in, in local uh, regions, right? Uh, that's what we are able to articulate. So um, I do think that is very important to just have attention in that. And and yeah, you know, just to create this awareness for city councils of, of the benefits that cooperatives bring to, uh, to our community. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that, um, you know, I mentioned in 2018, this like bill, that was the first bill for worker ownership passed um, in, you know, decades, right? And since 2018, it's not as though we immediately saw a ton of support for co-ops at the federal level. What we saw was people being able to say, hey, the federal government expressed some support. Hey, local government, like, how could you ride this wave of like interest um, or, or how can you state government be like, it, like engaged with the federal funding for these initiatives? Um, you know, I saw it like that's that kind of thing can happen really easily. Like, um, I saw one, one particular worker owner in California was just really involved in with his local government. And he, he was able to say like, Hey, there's a lot of attention being brought to, to worker cooperatives. Like we should do a study. We should invest in worker cooperatives in our city. And almost immediately there was funding unlocked at the local level in this like you know like kind of like mid-sized city um in california directly to do technical assistance to help worker owners transition their businesses and support and cultivate the um the the uh the ecosystem there and you know like corey mentioned like philadelphia investing in technical assistance those things feed upon each other. So every time somebody at a local level is able to, is it is engaging, then we're able to tell that story at the federal level. So I think in terms of policies, I, I think it's really important that there's stuff happening at each level. So local, state and federal, um, because those things really feed into each other. And it's kind of just like building up support, whether it's just for worker cooperatives or kind of like a set aside. Um, you know, Rhode Island actually just set aside, it wasn't even funding, it was, you know, they they were they they just released um, licenses for cannabis, um, and for, for growing cannabis, for producing it, for processing it, and they set aside licenses specifically for worker cooperatives, and that's huge. That's actually ensuring that a piece of that business sector is owned and governed by the workers. And you know, it doesn't always have to exactly be money, but I think looking creatively specifically at different industries can be really helpful. Um, to that work. And then, and then also just kind of like looking at the field, because as there is interest growing, there is all sorts of people who start to say, oh, what is worker ownership? What's employee ownership? And just, you know, we kind of use those kind of interchangeably. Um, you know, uh, in the chat, Diane had, uh, had been asked the question about mission aligned investing. And one thing that I think I am increasingly worried about is people that are not from the movement getting a hold of all of this money to do things like worker that they call worker ownership or worker uh, mostly that they call worker ownership, but the worker ownership is really only like 20%, 30% um, of the business. So that that's the thing that I, I think is particularly concerning for me. Like, I think that, I think that investing has like a really big place for, for cooperatives, but I think a lot of education needs to be happening about 
like what actually is a worker cooperative and we can like like organizations like like PACA and the federation and like all sorts of regional groups are able to like help you know um define what is what is a cooperative and what isn't a cooperative and uh, make sure that the funds are actually getting in in the hands of the people who need it the most so i think that's something that's really really highly on my mind um I want to shift us a little bit to just talk about like what are the other kinds of challenges because I think in this context, right? Uh, um, you know, I'm I'm assuming a lot of folks who have tuned into this call, you're not like steeped in co-op culture, right? Um, so like, kind of what are the what are the the challenges facing co-ops, and um, maybe I'll kind of thread in a question here about like actually how do you center laborers and stay viable? I think Katrina was asking specifically in childcare. But I think it kind of would hold true across a lot of different industries. Like, how do you, and maybe like especially Terrell and Anna, like, um, how how do you actually like stay viable, but also also make sure that workers are centered for the long term? I can go. Um, we stay viable because we stay active in the community and getting the word out about co-op. Um, we keep and and how we stay valuable and in that and keep our workers centered is because they are the ones that are actually going out in the in the community and getting the word out about co-op. They are the owners. You know, for us, our in our consumers that we provide quality care for have been with us for over 30 years. And why? Because they have an owner coming into their home to provide the quality of service that they have. So then with even in our committees, we have a happiness committee. I always talk about the happiness committee because the happiness committee is that com committee that just does all the happy things, you know, like when COVID came and people still needed gloves and masks and things like that, that committee were the ones responsible for delivering those things. All the while they're out there still talking to people in the community, talking to people that don't have a clue about co-op as we do co-ops, as we do recruitment, helping them understand that, yeah, you may see me here as a recruiter, but I'm the owner of the company and, I, and I'm looking for you to join us. So our workers stay centered because they are the center. Um, everything that we do here is done by workers, our receptionists, our uh, schedulers, our all of our departments here at Home Care Associates are ran by the workers. And, and in the office, outside the office, in the community, even when we're doing phone calls, I, Use me for an example. I went to Washington to the White House to speak about worker um, co-ops, not just representing my business, but representing all worker co-ops so that as a unit, we, again, get first seat at that table because this is the I, this is the only way I see businesses being really beneficial. And COVID shown show that a lot of businesses are not here anymore, but most of the, our co-ops, we're still here, you know? So um, I believe that if you center the worker, you will always stay valuable. Mm, I just have to say, I have so much admiration and respect for you, Terrell, and for all like workers in the care economy. Um, I was working at the Federation when COVID uh, started and I was in direct contact with workers and um, those workers that were in the care economy, so much respect for, you know, all the care that they were doing is still, you know, for communities and how they were, they were able to, you know, like articulate ways to still being able to care for each other. Um, I do agree, you know, that um, in our cooperative, it is care is so central, right? Like, and I think that that's like part of the reason why I am in cooperatives, um, because I do see cooperatives also, you know, and political alignment with solidarity economies and like seeking a way for sustainable living, for sustainable economies, for feminist economies, where we are really... Uh, trying to be more integrated in relationships of interdependency with each other, 
but also with the planet, <laughs> you know, like we do know that an, an economy that is just based on extractive economy it just doesn't work, right? This planet, it just can't take it. Um, so in cooperatives, I think we see alignment in, in those values, right? Well, like caring for each other, um, making sure that we are prioritizing always uh, the, the well-being of the workers who are us, you know? And we want to make we want to make sure, you know, that we are economically sustainable, but also that our experience as worker and human beings are sustainable. So in our cooperative, we do have a lot of conversations around how this looks like in practice, right? Mm -hmm. How do we prioritize caring for each other? So um, in a time, you know, where there's a lot of work, we know that we have to be there. We know that this is going to be exhausting. But then we also allow ourselves to take some time for recover. Uh, and because we are worker owners, we can take those decisions. We can decide, you know what, we're going to take a couple of days, three days, a week of rest, of collective rest. And, and we know that this is going to be coming out of our labor, right? So we do center uh, our financial stability, but we do want it to make sure that we're going to be here uh, in the long run, right? Mm -hmm. So we're able to make those decisions um, because this is the kind of uh, workplace that we want to build. Mm -hmm. um, we do believe in, you know, what we call in Spanish, el buen vivir, which is like a good life. <laughs> we want to make sure that, that, that this is a place that we feel good about it, you know, and that it is caring for, for everybody who is part of the cooperative. I'll also mention, because I know you asked Mo, like, what was one of the challenges that we've seen in, you know, building a co-op? And the only thing outside of funding that I can think of is buy-in, um, because most people that come over to the organization are not, like you said, may not have had the education or the know with all of a co-op or, um, or worker ownership. So, you know, they're coming from places where they're not used to being included. So sometimes you have some resistance with that. And once for us, what we do is we wear it on our sleeves every day. So if there's a person that's come in that's really not interested, you know, there are people that we invite to our committee meetings so that they can see themselves how the work is and they're able and we ask them what ideas do you have you may not be able to vote but we can still take your ideas it doesn't mean that it goes in vain so in including all of those little small parts for people to have that buy-in to the worker ownership is really important because we have to think about sometimes their backgrounds or where they're coming from, where that resistance may be coming from and kind of help them through that so that they can see the bigger picture and how at the end of the day in this model, how they will be more um, self-sufficient and supported in the work that they do. And, and primarily because for us at Home Care, we are a very um, diverse group in our business, but the majority of us are women. So we see that as power, where somebody else may look at that as a weakness, but we exude the power, you know? And when I say of women, that mean it's any, if you identify as a woman, you're born as a woman, whatever, you know, for our majority, you're included. So we, ex we make sure that we put that picture forefront for people to see so that they know when they're coming into our co-op or into a co-op model that is not you know just oh we want your money for the fees to download to uh be able to pay for the stock and things like that no we actually really need your voice we really need your ideas we really need the expertise outside of what you you come here as a caregiver but you have expertise outside of that and that part is what we need and that's in your brain so we dig through that with our um people coming into our co-op so that they not only understand how we work, but also understand how to be a business owner as well. Yeah, absolutely. I, um, you really hit on something that's like so important that this idea of, of buy-in, um, and that is, I think one of the, the, the central things kind of like building in, what does it look like, um, to, 
shift your um kind of incorporate this question that we have like should like this cultural mental modal shifts um to in order to create a call because it is very different mm -hmm. right it takes a lot and i know um there's a call called pv squared in massachusetts that has a two-year onboarding plan for new worker owners to help them just like get into it, it, it you just kind of chip away at like all the time like i love that example of just like including people in committee meetings mm -hmm. to learn a little bit more and um and and just exposing them to like what it actually does mean to be an owner is so important um but you you also hit um on something terrell i think like the the you know the fact that the home care associates is majority women that like that is power and that is how we're kind of like flipping not only this like uh the the um the gender wealth gap here but also the gender power gap yeah. um so let's talk about that just for a couple of minutes about like how you all feel about cooperatives and 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 what it feels like to to operate um or to work with folks who identify as women um in this space um you know i can throw out the fact that like about just about half of the workers in the worker co-op field are women. A lot of that actually has to do with um, home care cooperatives that are in the field, um, and you know that that's a that's a that's a big deal within a particular industry to actually have that 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 kind of balance of of power. Um, so I'm, I would love for for all of you to talk a little bit more, um, especially Anna and Corey, just like how you see that playing out with Corey, the cooperatives that you work with and on your workplace and the people that you work with. Um, how do you see that that gender equity um, issues playing out? Shall I? Oh, oh no, you please, Terrell. Go for it. I, I just want to, I, I just have to say this because I say this to anyone coming in because sometimes people are also resistant in that space because they may have gotten some resistance before but we tell them here it it you're human there's no race anything is you're human um and if you have the ability and the brains to learn we're going to teach it to you and see how you shine from there and then well, that's included in everything that we do here at home care thanks Terrell. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think a lot has already been touched on. Um, I would say like, you know, in, when I look at who we've even given technical assistance to over the past year or two years, the overwhelming majority by, I mean, I, I'm going to make up a statistic right now, but like 75%, like something like that of like the folks we've worked with like are women, non-binary folks, uh, trans folks, um, like, and it just shows to me um, that, that this feel that worker cooperatives are sought out by folks that want to be operating differently in this economy, want to be working collaboratively. Um, and cause they see like how this private um, extractive system like is not doesn't does not work for them but also doesn't like match like how they want to live and um i think one that can be incredibly beautiful to work with people on because you have people that like really are coming at this work with like their whole hearts and like the the real desire to do something that like fits with what they feel rather than how they've, you know, Terrell was talking about this at the beginning, um, like often feeling so alienated in their workplaces and like now coming, you know, to this work and like really wanting to, um, like this thing that they do every, you know, the majority of their day is like under our current system, we do spend the majority of our hours at our workplace. And so like, you know, people wanting to spend the majority of their hours doing doing work in a way that feels good and that they have a say over and that they have a say over it in a cooperative manner, like just can be really beautiful. 
Um, but the other portion of that, which I guess also fits in like with challenges of co-ops that has been discussed, is that when we're thinking of like the, the majority, I mean, I think DAWI, which is uh, the sister org of the Federation, as Mo said in the chat, um, I think they said like since 2010, like 68% of co-ops are are um, founded by women. Um, like, uh, like when we're looking at this, um, like we are seeing that like the problems of this that exist in often feminized and racialized industries, because um, I think I'm trying to remember the exact statistic, but it was something like 60% that Dowie also said since 2010 um, are founded by black, brown and other people of color. And um, and so when we're looking at industries that are oftentimes feminized and racialized, like they're existing within the problems of those industries. So like when we're thinking of challenges that folks can like, support us with it's like fighting for care work to be you know compensated in the way it should be insurance rates for care workers are ridiculous like you know fighting so that it's not like so completely um like you know uh horrific for like these co-ops to be able to exist um so i think it's like thinking through like how do we make these industries not so hard um, and so much care work is just like so hard for the people within these industries and co-ops are oftentimes like in these industries. So that was a long and winding answer, but um, it's beautiful and challenging because our, our economy, as Diane said at the beginning, was not set up for the folks that we really, you know, want to see. Um, yeah, like build community control and circular wealth. Check. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, if I can add, you know, like I really appreciate like the the framework that that was offered at the beginning uh, before we came into the panel, um, because I think it is important to have also this analysis, right? Like where are we coming from? How we got here? Um, and so if, if we talk about, you know, of course, you know, these principles like primitive accumulation and like capital and material accumulation, like we know that they are like uh, specific reasons why we are where we are, right? Because, uh, you know, women, uh, genders that don't identify with the heterosexual, like, uh, you know, like, um, patriarchal, you know, like you don't look like certain person, right? You are excluded or you're gonna have a hard time really entering uh, positions of power in the economy uh, or or, in, or like even just being able to participate in the economy, right? So um, I think that in our experience with Colmenar, we work with a lot of uh, women and specifically with immigrant women. Uh, and once again, we're not surprised, I'm not surprised as I was mentioning at the beginning, um, that's part of my origin, right? Like I'm part also of like family that, um, you know, has a history of displacement. Um, my grandmother was also an indigenous woman that migrated to Mexico City, like, and then being in the uh, domestic worker industry. Um, and we have to navigate all of these, uh, you know, ways and barriers to be able to, not just to succeed, but to be able to be included. Right, to be able to be recognized. So um, when I was mentioning, you know, my personal story, right, of like being a street vendor, those are like the stories that we encounter here with immigrant communities and a lot with women, right? A lot of, uh, not just with women working a woman, but like mothers uh, or caretakers, right? So when they come to this country, um, it is challenging to be able to find a place where you can find uh, dignity in the workplace. So in cooperatives, uh, we found this space where they can be uh, shaping uh, for their own protection, right? For their own like way of having agency over their own labor, which is uh, very important and it should be essential and available to everybody, but that's not the case, right? So in cooperatives, uh, a lot of the communities that work with, um, in, in, you know, this immigrant community that I was like mentioning, um, we do see that a lot of uh, the workers, uh, you know, that we're working with um, are 
either having a hard time finding jobs or even coming from cases of wage thief, you know, or harassment, or they are many times survivors of domestic violence. And so a lot of the times when they come together to form a business, the cooperative has been the business model that has been able to provide that uh, container for building that community wealth, right? That collective wealth. Uh, so it is a way in how we kind of like find a way to uh, to be included in the economy. So th those are a lot of the communities that we work with. Um, and I was just also like looking at some of the data, you know, that um, they came out a few years ago also, I think in 2018, um, uh, the, this was a, a study that was put together, the Latinx Core Power in the U.S. It was a report that was put together by Esther West of the University of Wisconsin, the Center for Cooperatives, and Dr. Jessica gordon Lempar of the City uh, University of New York. That was showing, uh, identifying uh, around 180 cooperatives of, uh, um, they have uh, members, they identify as Latinx, and these are cooperatives, they're like cross sectors, so worker cooperatives, consumer, producer, et cetera, different type of cooperative sectors. And in the uh, state of the sector report for worker cooperatives and democratic workplaces, I do believe in 2018, um, there was, uh, uh, approximately 38% uh, of the workforce that was identifying as Latinx. So we do see uh, the gender gap and also we see other identities that have also been uh, excluded from economic participation. So um, this is where we are here, right? This is like the, the connections and bridges that we wanna be able to, to build among our communities. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much, Anna. I know we're running a little bit low on time. So I'm gonna ask each of the panelists to do just like one one minute um, to answer this like last question and hopefully incorporate a call to action. So knowing that like not everyone on this call is part of a co-op or, or is going to be a part of a co-op, um, what's one thing a business can learn and one resource that you might point people towards? And what is, and maybe these are the same thing, but what's one call to action that you would give to folks who are listening on this call? Um, and maybe we'll start with Terrell and then Corey and then Anna. I'll say, of course, vote, 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 vote. Make sure you please vote. That will be my call to action. That's my thing right now. Just please vote, please vote. Because in this vote, there's a lot of... Um, things on the table that could, considering we just did a convening on worker co-ops, so it's on the table. So there's a lot of things on the table for businesses and co-ops right now that if we vote, that can stay on the table and can possibly prosper. Thanks so much, Terrell. Corey? Yeah, um, I guess in terms of finding resources, I mean, the Federation's website has a ton of resources, as does the Sister Org, Democracy at Work Institute. PACA has a lot of resources on our page. Comunar has created a lot of resources in Spanish, so please support their resources they've created. Um, and so all of those have wonderful resources. Um, in terms of a call to action, I mean, of course, if you see initiatives um, that will help support co-ops, your support is so wonderful. Um, Mo has been working on a big initiative, um, and you know other things that aren't like specific co specifically co-ops, but will help build the cooperative economy, like the public bank initiative that's been happening in Philly. Like it all, it all does help. And I also think like. You know, uh, I mean, you can form a co-op, just saying that you can form a co-op and I'd love to talk with you about it. Um, but uh, anything you do at your workplace, if you're not in a place right now to form a co-op, but anything that you do to help build some more economic democracy, I think creates like the, the ability to build a more like just economy. So check. Thanks, Corey. Anna, you want to wrap this up? Yeah, I mean, definitely, you know, if you're working with communities that are trying to find ways and how to be included in the economy, you know, immigrant communities, or like any of all these other identities that we were mentioning, uh, they're having a hard time and, um, and finding a place um, for, 
you know, for finding protections for their own labor, uh, reach out. Um, if you are a funder and you are trying to support worker cooperatives, but you are having a hard time knowing how can I do that, I want to learn more, you know, reach out, please. Um, if you are also uh, an organization that supports uh, small businesses uh, and you want to learn more about the cooperative model, reach out. And if you want to learn more even uh, about starting your own cooperative, I will say also that the Federation is just putting together uh, their annual conference this year uh, in September in Chicago, uh, and the registrations are open. And there is an opportunity to learn so much about cooperatives. There are workshops, there are trainings, there are panels. Um, we're going to be presenting a panel there as well, Menard, on the topic of conflict. Uh, and uh, communication skills also. Um, so, you know, that's like another invitation for learning more about cooperatives, but do reach out if you're trying to support um, cooperatives or communities in need, please reach out. Thanks so much, Anna. Um, we're just about time. So I'm gonna drop a link in the chat that includes, is, a, is a guide that has just like practical, uh, practical applications, if, whether you're co-op or not, for democratic workplaces. I think that's really important. Um, we're gonna send a ton of resources to folks that we didn't even, weren't even able to get to today. So I just wanna thank Terrell, Corey, Ana Martina uh, for being such an amazing panel and thank you to Women's Way for having us. Uh, this has been excellent. Thank you all for asking such amazing questions. Yes, big thank you to each and every one of you for your attendance and participation and engagement in the conversation. Um, I feel like the chat was popping, the Q&A was popping, which is always a good sign. Um, so kudos to the moderator and panelists. Thank you again for sharing your expertise. Um, we're excited as an organization to move into a solution space. So for those of you who are wondering, like, what can I do? Where can I find hope? please join us to learn more about how our communities are reimagining a more just economy. Um, September 20th is our third annual Gender Wealth Summit. So we'll come together in person, ideate, share strategies and ideas. So we hope to have you uh, join us then. And then we'll have our final Closing the Gender Wealth Gap Forum in November with our Changing the Narrative Fellows. So we definitely hope to see you then. Um, finally, please take the survey, which will be in the chat, and let us know what worked for you and what you'd like to see more of. Check out our social media and website for more announcements about events and programming. We can't wait to see you. Thank you all for joining. Thanks, everyone.